All right, hey folks. Um, so to this point, we've been talking about naming ionic compounds and molecular compounds. And um, there are some other compounds that we need to focus in on, hydrates and acids in particular, um, that we'll be using so much over the course of the year that you need to also learn how to name these fellas. So let's start with the concept of the hydrates. Now, hydrates are ionic compounds that can absorb water into their solid structures. Now, that sounds really odd, um, but it's exactly what it sounds like. For some reason, the crystalline structures of these compounds can actually hold water within them. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily liquid water. In fact, it's usually not liquid water, um, but it's, it's water that's been sort of held in the crystal structure. Um, so, let's take a look at what, uh, what I'm talking about here with a schematic. Hmm. I just did some quick online searches for this, and frankly, it's too complex for me to show you uh, what these things look like, because it's, there's no point, basically, in me showing you what they look like in terms of the structural formula. Um, however, what would be kind of handy is for you to see that sometimes hydrates actually don't contain water. I know that sounds strange, um, but the reason why uh, they, they normally would contain water, but you can drive the water off and have them become anhydrous, meaning they don't have water, which would not be a, a condition that it would hold for long because there's always water in the air and it would be what's called deliquescent, which would means it would absorb water out of the air. So some hydrates are indeed anhydrous. And in fact, it's um, kind of cool to see how different these things look. For example, copper, uh, I'm sorry, cobalt chloride, cobalt 2 chloride, which is COCl2, looks entirely different from cobalt 2 chloride hexahydrate, which is COCl2 dot 6H2O. Let me see if I can find some pictures of this so that you can see what I'm talking about. Hold on just a second. Okay, so you can see here, and in fact, let me just blow it up a little bit for you so you can see it better. Um, in the top one, that is the anhydrous copper 2 chloride, and the bottom one is copper 2 chloride that contains water. Now, moments ago, you just heard me, in fact, explain how you would um, name these things, and it's simply, it's a very simple naming scheme, which is, this is copper 2 chloride, you already would know that, uh, cobalt 2 chloride, you already know that. Um, now, the only thing that would be different here is that you may forget that cobalt actually has multiple different um, ions, and so you have to note that this is cobalt 2 with Roman numeral 2, and then chloride. And to denote that it's a, um, a hydrate, you have to say how many waters that it contains. And so in this case, it would be hexahydrate. And hexa is just like the prefix that we used for naming molecules, um, starting with mono and going up through uh, deca for 10. So nothing too fancy here, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, obviously you have, oh, actually there is one other one which is a little strange. You can have a half of a water and that would be a, a hemi, but typically it's gonna be uh, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca, just like we had the other day. Okay, um, all right, so that's naming hydrates. Now let's uh, turn the page here and talk about naming acids. Oh boy, what happened there? Uh, erase there. Naming acids is a bit more complex, but it's really, it's not awful. You'll be able to figure this out in a heartbeat. Um, now, the one thing you should understand about acids is that 
They're kind of like a cross between molecular substances and ionic compounds um, because they do dissolve in water just like an ionic compound does, um, despite the fact that for all intents and purposes they act much more like molecular substances um, in terms of how they're put together. Okay, so lots of covalent bonds and such, but not, I mean, in some cases, not always. Um, so, for example, um, we have uh, two different types of acids. We have ones that are monoprotic acids, and I'll explain to you what that means in a little bit. Um, but essentially what it means is, um, let's take it for an example, instead of trying to HCl is a monoprotic acid, okay? And um, it's monoprotic because when it does dissolve in water, so if we take a beaker and imagine that this is actually water here, it's going to break up into a single proton or hydrogen ion plus the anion, the chloride anion. Okay, so... Um, Always know, too, that when we're talking about acids, hydrogen is always going to be the cation involved. However, it's not always a single cation. In some cases, we have some forms of uh, acids that have multiple or polyforms of, of acids. And in that case, uh, one that's pretty familiar to you guys is H2SO4. Okay, So those are acids. Let me just erase this for a moment, because you guys also know these probably uh, by name simply because you have probably taken some science classes at some point in your life. You know that HCl is actually hydrochloric acid. So I want you to think about how we just did this naming scheme. We always start off with hydro, when we're talking about one where there's only a single hydrogen involved. Okay? And, actually it's not always... I'm sorry, you know what, I'm getting this a little bit confused here. Uh, I, I refer to this as monoprotic and then all that jazz about different uh, numbers of, of protons coming off. That comes off, that's going to be something we cover later. This, when I'm talking about mono, I'm referring to the fact that it's a monatomic ion that's going to be coming off as opposed to a polyatomic ion that's involved. So when we have a, uh, a monatomic ion, in, the, in this case the Cl- minus here, we always have the same kind of naming scheme. Hydro, and instead of saying chloride, we change it so that you have a suffix of IC followed by the word acid. So let's take a look. We have another one here, hydrogen and bromine together. Okay, And when you have hydrogen and bromine together, I think you can see you're going to have the hydro prefix. And you don't say bromide. Instead, you say bromic. Here's the IC. And then don't forget the acid. Okay, um, Let's... Uh, Select this and move this down a little bit. Oops. Just tore that apart. Yikes. Move this down because I want to fit in one more. Um, and that is H2S. And H2S, again, the mono piece, because I was confusing you before, has to do with that it, it's a monatomic ion. And with H2S, there are two hydrogens, um, and but it doesn't really make a difference here because we would still have the same thing. We call this hydro sulfuric acid. So the naming scheme is exactly what we saw with the other ones here. Interestingly enough, um, hydrosulfuric acid only forms an acid if it's dissolved in water. And other than that, it's actually hydrogen sulfide, which is a colorless gas. 
problem is that this is something that um, often is released um, by swamps and um, volcanic gases and things like that. And uh, when it goes up into the atmosphere, it then combines with the water that is naturally in the atmosphere, and um, it turns into the, uh, the hydrosulfuric acid. And that's the um, major component of acid rain. Okay, uh, let's look at these ones where we have polyatomic ions involved. Um, H2SO4, okay? When you have H2SO4, again, you guys probably know that this is sulfuric acid. Okay, and then if I perhaps, hmm, now I need to scooch these things up so I have a little bit of room to work with here. Let's scooch these back up here. Um, let's take uh, HNO3. This is referred to as nitric acid. So you might ask yourself, hmm, so clearly, you all, for when you have polyatomic ions, you just get rid of the hydro. Yeah, it is true. You just definitely get rid of the hydro piece when you do that. Um, but don't forget that these pieces here, this is a sulfate and this is a nitrate. Okay? So instead of having ATE, or at the end of this, you just add on the RIC, just like you did before. So the only thing that dif distinguishes hydrosulfuric acid from sulfuric acid is that sulfuric acid, when you knock off the hydro, it should trigger something in your brain to know that it's sulfate, the polyatomic ion sulfate, that is involved there. And then we have, let's do a couple more here, we have uh, H3PO4. You should be familiar with the PO4 as the phosphate. So this is going to be phosphoric acid. Okay, so uh, pretty straightforward here. Nothing too complex uh, with regard to naming hydrates and naming acids. Um, and, but it is something that you can expect to see on an upcoming test or quiz because we are going to use these so often during the school year that I want you guys to get familiar with them. All right, later.